Well, welcome to the Wednesday evening prayer service here at Eastland Baptist Church. Let's stand together and join our voices singing at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. If you're joining us by way of streaming, welcome again. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received thy sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon a tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond decree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, we'd like to welcome you to the evening services here at uh, Eastland Baptist Church. There's a lot going on. There's a lot, as you can see. You say, what is that? You'll find out just a little bit later. There's a, as I said, there's a lot going on. And tomorrow night, starting at 6.15, the men of Eastland are going to be meeting for a time of fellowship, a time of food, and just a great time to be together. I encourage you to come. And then the ladies are meeting at 10 to 6.30. Then Saturday, we have the Walk for Life, and then on March the 7th, which is a Tuesday, we have the Widow's Luncheon. March the 11th, we have Visitation. March the 12th is the best time of the year, Daylight Savings Time. I don't hear a lot of good reports. Anyways, and then the Day Springs will be here. It's a college that... Uh, that we have been supporting, and it's a great, it's just a great time of the, of the month, at the time of the year to be here, and I encourage you, if you will, to become a part of it, and uh, I, again, I encourage you to, to be a part of it. Okay, I'm going to ask the ushers to come as we take our offering. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about things. We have something special, and I'll let the pastor or whoever is going to introduce them, and to become a part of this service, you'll, you'll, you'll find out what it is. Okay, Father, we ask now that you'll bless this service. Thank you again for the opportunity of being here. And we pray your blessings upon uh, the time that we spend together. We pray that it be uh, informative, it be uh, a place that we can, when we read the scriptures, it'll stick out to us or just stand out. And I just pray that you'll help us to understand all the different things that are going on. And Father, we ask now your blessings upon the offering. Thank you that we can give back to you what you so graciously given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the offering.
Thank you, Brother Price. Uh, I want to look over the uh, prayer list uh, this evening with you that are on live stream. Welcome tonight. You don't have one of these, but we try to keep you updated. Again, I thank God for each and every one of you that do pray for people. And uh, I pray even though sometimes you don't see the results uh, over 500 times in the scripture, the Bible commands us to pray or talks about prayer. Uh, the very beginning part are folks who have been uh, dealing with cancer. Uh, most of these people we've been able to get in touch with in the last 24 hours. Uh, Miss uh, Creel was doing so well with her um, treatment, uh, but then got sick and they had to stop the treatment. So she's having trouble with the cancer now and she's, she's feeling bad. So please pray for Miss Creel. Tim McKinney is doing fine. Of course, he runs Transformation Village out in B Bithlow. Robin Doris told me her husband, RJ, has lung cancer. They did tests. They find out that it's contained there. It's not spread anywhere else, which is good news. Um, Dana Angel is going to have surgery next week. Of course, she's in North Carolina. Uh, Janice uh, Newby's aunt, uh, Jean Fikes, uh, passed away suddenly yesterday, 87 years of age, wonderful Christian lady. Uh, and uh, they're going to be flying out Monday and Tuesday for the viewing and for the funeral. So pray for Pastor Newby and Janice as they go there and support the family. Uh, Mrs. Rogers said that uh, her nephew who lives in Brooksville got a very good report on his pancreatic cancer. They believe they've caught it early and they're going to be, be able to treat it. So we're, we're, we're so happy for her. And then Lydia contacted us. Her mother's in uh, the big Advent hospital and she's on oxygen and been in there for a week, and she's very concerned about her. Last week talked about um, uh, Alexa. Uh, uh, she's 25, ha having seizures. That's the Webb's daughter. And then uh, Robin, I got an update from her about her aunt, also in Brooksville, and she's on hospice, and she's deteriorating, and uh, they, they have a, a lovely church family that's loving on them. But pray for Robin's aunt as uh, she goes through this. John Mark and his brother sit right here, James. Uh, John Mark's in the hospital with an infection. And then uh, we have five people in rehab. Uh, Carl's mama, Donna, is right up the road here. Your mama is Mary's right down there. Uh, and then there's Miss, uh, um, where's Miss Griffith. She, she's right next to your mama, I found out. I visited your mom and found out she's right next door. I felt bad that I didn't see her. Um, but we've had other people, Brother Rockwell, Andrea, have been going in to see those ladies. Um, and then also uh, Beth Park, her dad, at 96, had a fall, had the virus. Man, he's a tough old guy. They, they rehabbing him. He's doing really well. And then lastly, pray for uh, uh, Dan Parks, who's at Altamont, uh, being rehabbed. And each of these rehab, rehabs is different, you know, and I, I figured out talking to some of these people that uh, in this rehab when you go through stuff, you got to move. If you don't move, you're in trouble. I've seen people go through surgeries and not move and then deteriorate. And uh, I have a hard time moving at 65, so I'm not going to be critical, all right? So pray for these dear people. It's simple as this, that the people that are rehabbing them, treating them, can get them up and moving around, and healing begins. begins. So it's, it's an amazing simple thing, but not a simple thing. So pray for all these people. And let's ask God to bless our service tonight and our guest uh, who's here with us tonight and will be in our high school tomorrow morning. Father, thank you uh, for letting us be here. And dear Father, being a pastor, even this week, I've been made more aware of false teaching in our world coming from sources where there used to be good, solid biblical teaching and handling of the Word of God. And I see men have had their hearts and direction turn and are taking the same people down the wrong path there God I thank you for good Bible teachers on television on the radio that have national worldwide ministries I lift you up them up to you today tonight dear God that you'd bless their ministries and the way they try to battle false teaching in our world and people know so little about the Bible dear God they are susceptible by being deceived by these false teachers dear Lord and I pray for churches that they would stand on your precious, precious word. It's something that's heavy on my heart. I think about these people that have cancer, and uh, some of them are not doing well. Some are turned around and headed in the right direction, but they all need your grace. And each one of these people, someone loves. Each one of these people, 
I, I pray that you would use them uh, to draw people to your precious son as they're going, what they're going through. There are others who are going through general illness and there's a lot of uncertainty and nervousness, dear God. Please bring peace to uh, their lives, dear God. And then I pray for these, these, these uh, most, mostly older folks that are in rehab right now, been going through a lot of different things. Each one of their circumstances is just a little bit different, but they don't want to be there. They want to be home. They want to be near their loved ones. And, um, and I, I pray for them, that you would uh, uh, send the right people to love on them, to encourage them, that you would restore them and bring them back to their home where they want to be, dear God. Uh, I, I thank you that all the billions of people who ever walked the face of this earth, there's not one of them that misses your eye, dear God. We many times feel very insignificant. You tell us in your scripture not to be respecter of persons, not to honor other people over other people, and our sin nature is to do that, dear God. But I'm thankful that when the smallest person the most insignificant person in this world is lifted up in prayer. You see them, you love them, and you care about them. And lastly, dear God, I pray for the salvation of any of these people. May we have certainty of salvation, and we can by trusting your son, Jesus Christ. Bless tonight. May we be encouraged. May we have a desire to learn from your word and understand the scriptures. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand once again. If you are sitting in this section, even though you have reserved seating over there, if you would like to move closer to the middle so you can see, that would be great. We're going to sing one verse of What a Wonderful Savior. Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Thank you. You may be seated as just a brief introduction uh, tonight. Uh, next month is Easter because this is March, right? So April is Easter. On the Tuesday night before Easter, for the Resurrection Day, we have our Lord's Supper here as one of the times when we uh, observe the Lord's Supper. It's closely related to the Passover. And we have Brother Mark Robinson here tonight that is going to give us a demonstration and talk to us about the, the Passover. So come ahead, Brother Robinson. Good evening. It's certainly a joy to be able to share with you about the Passover and uh, prior to getting into the Word of God. And we will initially be in Exodus chapter 12. You want to turn there if you have your Bible. Uh, I did bring, uh, I've written a few books. Uh, they're out in the back, uh, commentary on Romans 9 through 11. Uh, I think it'll be very helpful. Uh, Romans 9 through 11 has nothing to do with individual uh, selection, predestination. It has everything to do with Israel and God's choosing of that nation. Uh, that's out there. And then there's a book of a dialogue that I had with a uh, a written dialogue with a uh, unsaved Jewish scientist uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and then in one of the, the other book out there is on Israel, God's Key to World Evangelism. Uh, I am totally convinced that the key to world evangelism is uh, through uh, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and, and that deals with that. And then there are a few DVDs out there. Uh, one being on uh, understanding the Israel-Palestinian issue, about 90 minutes long. Uh, another one, not many of them on Christ in the Passover, a, a full Seder. And I'll explain Seder shortly for you, what it means. Uh, I did a few years ago. Uh, and the other one is a message on uh, to the Jew first, Romans 1.16. So that's back there. They're, they're not that expensive. My wife, Cheryl, who's right here, will be out there, and I'll make my way out there uh, sooner or later. We're going to look at Passover. Uh, Passover has evolved. And so we're going to look at the evolution of Passover through the uh, centuries, and we're going to initially start with the first 
Passover, Exodus chapter 12. Then we're going to come down a few thousand years to today's Passover table. And I've got a number of the items that are on the table today, on this table to my left. Uh, and I'll ex be explaining the, the important ones because some of them are, are not germane uh, to what we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. Then, as we conclude the message, we're going to go back some 2,000 years to the Passover Seder that Jesus led with his disciples. Because the first looks forward to that, the present looks back, and you'll see the tie-in uh, as we look at that. And I think you'll see some very amazing insights uh, to what Jesus was teaching uh, his Jewish apostles there. But as we open in Exodus chapter 12, I want to start with the first three verses. We're not going to look at the entire chapter. It's way too much. But it starts out in verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be on you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. So the, the religious year for the Jewish people starts uh, in, in the month of Nisan, Passover, around March, April. Uh, the civil year uh, starts with uh, Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, uh, in the fall. So this is the first month of the year. Uh, and in verse 3, we are told this. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now I want to draw your attention to uh, the, the, the very simple word, A. It, 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 it describes the lamb in a very, very general understanding. Take a lamb. Now, I would submit to you that what we're going to see in verses 3 and then 4 and 5 uh, parallel even the Word of God. See, after Adam and Eve sinned against God, God introduced the necessity of a sacrifice. He did that with that sh shedding of that blood of that animal, uh, and ultimately uh, the necessity of a sacrifice would be developed uh, within the nation of Israel and, and the Mosaic system, the Levitical sacrifices, uh, driving home the point, there has to be a sacrifice. And perhaps every religion of the world, to one degree or another, however they would define it, would agree that we need a sacrifice. Might be your good works. It might be a baby, it could be a whole bunch of things. But it starts out, and we are told in verse 3, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Now look at verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next down to his house take it according to the number of his souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So verse 4 gets very specific. Not general, not a lamb, but definitive, the lamb. As the word of God develops, we are, yes, introduced to the necessity of a sacrifice. But God gets very, very specific, very, very definitive on, def on defining and telling us that there is this one specific, definitive sacrifice that he would provide for the sins of the world, the Lamb of God. So when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he didn't say, behold, a lamb, just any particular sacrifice. Behold what? The, the definitive, specific sacrifice that God would provide, the Lamb of God, which the prophets wrote about the one coming. But look at verse 5. And all, um, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And verse 5 gets personal. Your lamb. It's, it's good to know there has to be a sacrifice. It's better to know that God's definitive 
substitute, sacrifice, the Lamb of God is Jesus. But that's not enough. It has to be personalized. The Lamb of God needs to be your Lamb. And so the scriptures tell us this is not a family affair. This is uh, an individual decision to make uh, the Lamb of God, Jesus the Lamb of God, your Lamb. He died for your sins. So there's this progression from a Lamb, the Lamb, your Lamb. Now, in the Jewish world, Passover has been celebrated. It's the longest celebrated uh, celebration uh, around. And th through the years, there have been uh, hundreds and hundreds, thousands actually, of Haggadahs that are produced. They're referred to as Passover Haggadahs. This is one that I have put together that I use when we do the entire uh, evening, the Seder, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, Haggadah means to tell or to show forth. And so you're telling the story or you're showing forth the story of the Passover. In every, I, I have, uh, I think I got rid of some of them, but at one time I had some 50 to 60 different Haggadahs in my library of the three to 4,000 that had been made through the years. At one point in all of those, and I, uh, I suppose in all three or 4,000, at one point it'll tell the participant, when you partake in the Passover, you're not just partaking in it as a historical remembrance. It's personal. And you need to understand that it's not just a lamb or even the lamb, but you need to personalize it that it's your lamb. Now superimpose that understanding upon our communion, right? You know, if you only know there's going to be a sacrifice or that the sacrifice is Jesus, uh, you should not partake in communion. Uh, you have to have personalized it, your Lamb of God. And that's how the participants in the Seder should look at it. Not that they all do, but that's how they're supposed to. Now, look down, and there's so much in chapter 12, but we're not going to be uh, able to look at uh, uh, very much at all. But go down uh, to verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. In the original Passover, there are only three items on the table. There's the lamb, there's the bitter herbs, and there's the unleavened bread. On today's table, there's a host of other things. And when you think uh, back 2,000 years ago, uh, the Passover that Jesus celebrated, there's at least one additional element on the table, which would have been the, the cup, the juice, the wine that was on the table. It wasn't in the first Passover. So keep that in mind. Now, I want you to look at one more verse before we move on to the present Passover of today. And that is down in verse, um, oh, it's verse um, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. The Passover is the lamb. The Passover is not the death angel passing over the, over the homes when he saw the blood. It's not the Jewish people passing uh, over the Red Sea that had split and uh, ultimately to the promised land after a desert wandering for a while. Uh, the Passover is the lamb. Take the lamb and slay it, kill it, you're killing the Passover. Keep that in mind. That's very, very important. 
So there's more that we could look at here in this first Passover. But I want to bring you to our table today. Passover, I'm Jewish. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. I was saved at the age of 27. And growing up as a, a child in a Jewish home, uh, for me, Passover was the highlight of the year. We didn't celebrate Christmas. We certainly didn't celebrate Easter. We celebrated Passover. That was the highlight. And uh, we lived, when I was young, uh, outside of uh, New York City in Westchester County. And my grandparents, my mother's parents, had a very large apartment uh, in New York City on Park Avenue. And every year they would host the Passover in this large apartment. And, it, and their dining room could, we, it was squeezed in, but we could, they could fit about 40 to 50 people in their dining room, seated. And we would have family come literally from all over the country, from Florida and California, certainly in New York and New Jersey. And, and we'd have 40 or 50 people congregate together in my grandparents' uh, apartment in Park Avenue. And, and I loved it. And it was a long evening. We would get there about 5 o'clock, and we would leave normally close to midnight. And, and it's all structured around the reading of the... Haggadah, telling the story. Now, one of the main highlights for the children was this matzah bag. And this has been on the table for centuries. Early in the evening, this is a uh, trifold bag or tri-compartment bag, better said. And in each of these compartments is a board of matzah. And what happens early in the evening is the middle board of matzah is removed and it's broken and the larger portion is taken and it's wrapped in a linen napkin. Sometimes there's a special bag. But this is referred to as the afakoman. Now the afakoman represents the lamb. And on today's table, there's a lot of additions because when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, you could no longer uh, get a lamb, sacrifice it at the temple, take it to the home and eat it. Uh, things had to change dramatically, and they did. This was introduced after 70 AD in the form that is today with a, uh, a tri-compartment bag and it's always the middle piece that is removed that represents uh, the lamb and represents the Messiah. Now, why as a young 8-year-old, 9-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, and so on, was I interested in this portion? Because it would be hid somewhere in the home. And after the meal, all the children present would go look for this. And the child who found it would bring it back to the, uh, to the head of the Seder, the father of the home usually, and would get a very valuable gift. Now I started attending, I'm going to date me a little bit. I started attending uh, Passover Seders at my grandparents uh, when I was about eight years of age, around 1957. And the gift that we would get if we found this was $10. Now you say, what's the big deal about $10? Well, today, maybe not a lot. But in 1957, when you could buy a brand new automobile for like maybe $1,200, or a brand new home for ten dollars to $12,000, $10 was a lot of money for an 8-year-old, for a 10-year-old for a 12-year-old, for a 70-plus-year-old. But anyway, so we really look forward to finding this. And at the end of the meal, it would be brought back, and it would be taken out, and it would be broken and passed to everybody present, and we would all partake of it. And that would be the last item of the evening taken. Now, Seder itself literally means order. There's an order to the Passover. 
And the order of the Passover goes back for centuries, I believe even to the time of Jesus and previous to the time of Jesus. And the order of the Passover basically revolves around four cups of juice or cups of wine. And I use wine in a generic sense. This was not at the original Passover, Exodus chapter 12. It was on the table of Jesus' Passover. Now, turn with me to Exodus chapter 6. The four cups of juice have titles or names. And they are named after the I wills of Exodus chapter 6. Verses 6 and 7. Now, uh, as we delve into this a little bit later on in the message, uh, what you're going to see and what I see in this is just one of, one of the amazing providential happenings of the Word of God. It wasn't in the first Passover. It was there, the cups, at the time of Jesus, as best as I can determine, and I can't nail it down, and I have not found anything, but the juice, the cups of wine, were added to the Passover table some 200 to 250 years before the time of Jesus. Now, look at the I wills. Look at verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So the first cup in the evening is the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out is to sanctify, is to set apart you. And so that's the first cup in the evening. The second cup in verse 6 is the next I will phrase. And I will rid you out of their bondage. Deliverance. They've been delivered from the bondage of the Egyptians. Now, those, for those first two I wills, those first two cups in the Seder. Remember, there's an order here. And when you, and when you refer to the, to, to the Seder, to a Jewish person, he'll know exactly what you're talking about. They come prior to the meal. See, the meal is, is part of the, the service. It's in the middle of the service. And these two cups come prior to the meal. And then after the meal, you have the final two cups. Now understand, uh, in, in my growing up, this would have been a four or five, six hour evening very easily. It would have been the same with Jesus when we look at that. Probably not quite as long maybe two or three hours. But the cups that I want you to grasp a hold of, the cups that I want you to remember, are the third cup and the fourth cup. Look at the third, I will, the end of verse six. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. The third cup is the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. It's at the end of the meal. I will redeem you. And the final cup of the evening is called or referred to as the cup of acceptance, coming from verse 7. And there are actually two I wills here, where it says, And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. I will accept you as my people, when you accept me as your God, the cup of acceptance, which is towards the end of the evening. So, so keep those cups in mind. The third cup, redemption. The fourth cup, acceptance. Now, there are other things on the table. Uh, there's a shank bone of the lamb, which represents the sacrifice. Uh, there's the washing of hands at the beginning. 
Uh, and normally this is filled and the leader will just pour it over and, and wash his hands and, and there's an egg on the table and there's a mixture called horoset and there's bitter herbs. There's a whole bunch of items on the table. But the two that I want to focus in on that I've mentioned is the afakoman and the cups of wine and specifically the third cup and the fourth cup. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 26. And we'll pick it up at verse 19. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them. And they made ready the Passover. Passover is an evening celebration. It's around a table. The center point at this time certainly was the lamb, which would be brought to the temple, slaughtered, and the edible parts brought back to the home. But there were other items on the table. Whether they had a Haggadah in written form or they just recited the story, I believe there's no question that they would have recited the story at least of the exodus from Egypt. But we also know that the juice was on the table and the bread was on the table. But there would have been other items as well. Now, they had prepared the Passover. When the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. So they're in the meal portion. And we know the one who would betray our Lord. But go down to verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take heed, this is my body. Now that's what we do in communion. And, and understand something. This is a Jewish Passover. They understood that everything done at that table was symbolic. To them, there was only one original Passover, Exodus 12. And the command to celebrate it yearly was to be done in remembrance. And everything was a picture, was an illustration, was symbolic. So when Jesus took that bread and said, blessed it, and said, take eat, this is my body, he didn't mean that bread is literally his flesh. This is symbolic. This is illustrative. Take and eat this bread. Now, the Jewish people have a number of different explanations for this matzah bag and the afikoman. It's almost certain, I would say it's 100% certain, that this bag did not work its way onto the Passover table until after 70 AD, when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed and the Jewish people were scattered to the nations of the world. And so the Jewish people have a number of explanations for this trifold bag and the three boards of matzah. They will tell you the primary explanation, there's more than one, is that those three boards of matzah uh, speak of uh, the, um, the Israelites and the Levites and the Kohanim, the high priest, or the priestly line, high priestly line. So ultimately, the whole nation of Israel. There's other explanations. It's not worth talking about them at this point. But none of their explanations have any historical basis whatsoever. Without going into the historical background of it, I, I will submit to you that this entire drama of the matzah bag, and then the afikoman came into the Jewish world 
through Jewish believers in Jesus, who wanting to celebrate this centuries-old holiday, festival, Passover, but wanting to honor the Lamb of God, introduced this bag, which doesn't speak of uh, the Israelites and, and the Levites and the Cohens or whatever it might be, but it speaks of the one God of Israel. And we know that the scriptures tell us that God is a triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Co-equal, co-eternal. It's never the top. It's never the bottom. It's always the middle board that's removed. It wasn't the Father. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was the Son of God who stepped out of heaven, clothed himself in humanity, and ultimately, just like this uh, matzah was broken, uh, he was cut off, he was broken, as it were, for the sins of the world. They wrapped him then in a burial cloth. You take the afikomen, and a burial cloth, burial garment, even to this day, in the Jewish world has to be all white. Speaks of purity, of righteousness. After the third cup of wine, the child brings this back, gets the reward. It's passed among everybody present. And this afikomen represents the Lamb and the Messiah. And the afikomen, the word afikomen, uh, actually is a Greek word that literally means I came, I came. It's the Messiah, the Son of God, who stepped out of heaven, walked among humanity, was caught off, broken for the sins of the world, but came back, rose again on the third day. And yes, the wages of sin is death. But, aren't you glad for the buts of the Bible? But the gift of God is eternal life. When you find Jesus, when you accept Jesus, you get the greatest gift there is. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life. This gift, $10 for my family, which would be maybe 150 to 200 in today's economy, pales in comparison. And that afikomen didn't come onto the table in the form it is until after 70 A.D. Now, there's a Jewish writer who's dead now who studied the Passover uh, very, very uh, deeply. He is convinced that when Jesus picked up that bread, as we looked at here in Matthew 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them present, said, take, eat, this is my body, that he actually picked up the afikomen bread, which represented at this time, at the time of Jesus, not the Messiah, or excuse me, not the lamb, because they had a lamb sacrifice, but the Messiah. And so when he picked up the afikomen representing the Messiah, this represents me. And the insight is amazing. And the introduction of the afikomen to the table after 70 AD better reflected the truth that those Jewish believers had of the triune God, the Son of God, stepping out of heaven, clothing himself in humanity, being buried, died for the sins of the world, and buried and rising again. And whomever uh, accepts him, finds him, gets a very valuable gift. But then look at verse 27. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is right after the meal. Jesus picked up the third cup. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And said, drink this. Drink all of it. And I'm going to drink it with you. Because in a few short hours, I'm going to shed my blood for the sins of the world. Because I'm the redemption lamb for all the world's sins. 
drink this. And again, the, the symbolism had to be striking. But then look at verse 29. And verse 28, it tells us, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That wine is not the blood. It is symbolic of the blood. But then look at verse 29. And this to me is mind-blowing, amazing, uh, superlative. Use all kinds of different words. This is one of the things that, to me, the, 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 the scripture is the word of God. But sometimes you see something like this, at least I do, and I, and I, and I sit back and say, wow, wow. Verse 29, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I'll drink the third cup, the cup of redemption. In a few short hours, I will die for the sins of the world, shed my blood. But I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. How many cups remain in the evening? One. And it's called the cup of? acceptance. I'm not going to drink any more of this cup until, there's a qualifying word, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, there's only one requirement for the kingdom of God to be established on planet earth. That's the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, turning to the Lord. And they say, blessed is he, Jesus, that comes in the name of the Lord. And Zechariah 12.10 says, when they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. What I find fascinating, that fourth cup, I will take you to me as a people when you take me as your God. Amen. The cup of acceptance. That phrase is used some um, 15 or 16 times in the Old Testament. Every single time it's used in a future tense, in an eschatological tense. Now, the exception would be the first use of it in Exodus 6. But when you understand what Jesus was doing uh, and, and commenting on it, you see even in Exodus 6, even though contextually there, it has nothing to do with the latter days, the end times. It, it fits. Because every other use, and it's, it's always in the, present, in, in the future tense, with one exception I'll share in a second. It's always at the end of the tribulation when the Jewish people have accepted Jesus is their God, and he accepts them as his people. Amen. There's only one time it's in the present tense. That's found in Zechariah 13. Now, Zechariah 13 in verses 8 and 9, this tribulational events. It's in this coming seven-year tribulation period. God says in verse 8 of Zechariah 13, It shall come to pass that all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Two-thirds of the Jewry will be, die, will be killed in the tribulation period. And, and I will bring, verse 9, I will bring the third part through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, what is Roman? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be Amen. saved. They shall call on my name. I will hear them. And I will say, it is, present tense, my people. And they shall say, the Lord is, present tense, my God. It's the same terminology with the exception that the others are in the future tense. They will. And here it's in the present tense, it is. But it's in a future passage. 
Providentially, God allowed those cups of wine to be introduced some 200 to 250 years before the time of Jesus. So when he was leading this Passover Seder and picked up the third cup, he said, drink you all of it. It's the cup of redemption. I'm going to die for the sins of the world, so drink it all. I'll drink it with you. But I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. I won't drink the fourth cup. Because the fourth cup is the cup of acceptance. When you, the Jewish people, accept me as your God, and I will accept you as your people, so I will not drink this cup, the fourth cup, until I drink it new with you in my kingdom. What brings again the kingdom into existence, the messianic kingdom? When the Jewish people accept Jesus as their God, and he accepts them as his people. It's a, it's a mind-boggling, it's an amazing introduction providentially of these cups that Jesus would use to communicate a truth that those Jewish people around that table that night would have fully understood. But we miss today because we don't understand the background of the Passover. We don't understand how it imposes itself, if you will, on today's communion. What a fascinating look in the biblical truth in Jesus using the Passover and what it's all about. Amen. And so I just want to challenge you very briefly as we close with where we started. A lamb the lamb, your lamb. Now, this is a Wednesday night service. I presume all of us probably are believers, but maybe not. Maybe you've grown up hearing about Jesus and knowing that there has to be a sacrifice for sins. Maybe you've heard for many, many years or decades that the sacrifice is Jesus. But maybe you've never personalized it and made him your lamb. Amen. Easter's coming in a month. It's personal. He came and died for your sins. Don't miss the insights of the Passover. Don't miss the whole focus of Easter. He rose from the grave, yes, but he rose for you and your sins. And you need to recognize that and accept him for the forgiveness of sins. Personalize it. Forget about the guy sitting next to you or the gal sitting next to you or your husband or your wife. Don't worry about that person. He died for you, your lamb. Let's pray. Pastor. Father, we are grateful and thankful for your blessings and goodness. And Lord, there's, there's other things we could look at, but this just uh, comes to the heart of, of really what Passover is about from the first to the present to the one 2,000 years ago. And they killed the Passover. They killed the lamb. It says in Corinthians, in, in, uh, it says, for even Christ, our Passover, our lamb, the sacrifice for us. So we rejoice in our Savior, our lamb, who willingly died for our sins, that we could have life. We give you thanks, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Robinson. Ushers, would you get together? Let's take an offering for this brother. Um, we met him last year in our um, uh, missions conference. I met him in Chicago, and so glad you were here tonight. Again, I, I look at the different ages tonight. I try to think if I was a young person, would that bore me, or that would, would that spark my interest in the Word of God? Uh, the nation of Israel is incredible that they exist today and they exist in the land of Israel today is absolutely amazing. Yeah. 
It's absolutely amazing. And uh, if this doesn't spark your interest, you come up, men. In the Word of God, you know, most Jewish people that I run across, uh, the, the only thing they read growing up is the Torah. I said, did you read the prophets? Like when you were in Zechariah and places like that, and they say no. They know so little. I know, as a Baptist, I know much more about the Jewish people than they know. And, and Jesus is right in front of them, and they don't even see it. And uh, one day, the Jewish people, like you just read in Zechariah, are going to turn back to Jesus. And I want Jesus is going to rule and reign in this earth. And why we don't tell people about Christ, the Messiah, is I'm sitting there just getting excited. I've always heard the... Uh, the Passover taught from a, a, an Old Testament perspective. I've never really heard it from a New Testament pers perspective that the Jewish people... Remember, young people, this has been going on 3,500 years. This is incredible. And, um, and again, it may have been difficult for some of you because you don't know the Bible. He alluded some things if you didn't know. But maybe you would study this and have a desire for the things of God. Uh, we need to make sure that we leave this, uh, guys, on our live stream for a long time. We need to encourage our people to watch this between now and Easter, and they can put these things together. Uh, I think it's a very great teaching tool. Again, we're living in an age when people do not read the Bible. Therefore, they are easily deceived and turned away from Jesus Christ into false things. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I pray for, our, pray for our young people. Our school will hear this tomorrow morning. And uh, if you're in our school, young people, pay attention a second time and try to pick something up, else up on it. But pray that our young people will have a desire to hear tomorrow morning. Father, thank you so much for this dear man. Uh, what an amazing thing that this brother at 27 years of age, raised in a Jewish home, what an incredible testimony how he realized who the Messiah was. I thank you. But dear God, I pray for all the Jewish people. I pray for Gentiles, that we would care about their precious souls and try to show them who the Messiah was, that he was Jesus Christ. He's from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. I pray you bless this offering, dear God. Uh, bless this brother and his ministry and his outreach. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Robinson, are you going to go back by your table in case anybody has anybody to ask questions? Okay. <laughs> uh, if you have not been at one of our Lord's Supper services, uh, we have one coming up the Tuesday before Easter. Uh, we do that uh, to commemorate the day in which it was instituted, and we use the matzah cracker, which uh, Brother Robinson says he uh, hadn't seen people do that before in the Lord's Supper. So, uh, uh, I've got a few more things that I've learned about this, and uh, it, it was exciting to me. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the knowledge that has been imparted about how Jesus Christ, when he instituted, it was symbolic. And we always, at the Lord's Supper, make it a very personal thing. And that is, uh, that is something that is, uh, he emphasized, and I believe that's important as well. Well, let's stand together and be dismissed singing, Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me.
back Sunday morning, 10 o'clock in your classes. God bless you.